the principle relative to the identity of thought and of being and the coincidence between the logical and the historical. An important principle of Hegelian philosophy is the identity between thinking and being. Kant considered there to be an unbridgeable trench between thinking and being and that the true face of being, the thing in itself, is something that thinking or knowledge can never reach, it is something that is by principle unknowable. Hegel critiqued this point of view, he opposed the metaphysical rupture between thinking and being, he considered that if we were to radically separate thinking and the thing itself, being, and if we were to affirm absolute separation of the thing itself and knowledge, then we would always be reduced to a state of not being able to know things and we would never be able to resolve the question of how knowledge is possible. Hegel says that this point of view drives us towards doubt and despair. Hegel advances the idea that the true aspect of a phenomenon, or a thing, is necessarily what is known to us through correct thinking and thus things in themselves are knowable in principle. Hegel considered that the two contrary aspects of thinking and being are united in an internal fashion, on the one hand, being is the content of thought. Without being, thought would lack content, since it would be empty. On the other side, outside of thought, things or being would lose their dimension of truth. Thought is what seizes and brings about the essence of things. For Hegel, things are nothing but the exterior manifestation or the exteriorization of thought. Further, what is exteriorized is finally brought to be negated and to re entwined with its primitive base. To the interior of thought, this is why thought and being are in reality two aspects of the same thing. However, these two aspects are not situated on the same footing, such that, according to Hegel's perspective, thought is what leads, it is first, it is then followed by things, or being, as subordinate, they are the products of thought. On the basis of this principle of identity between thinking and being, Hegel held that, in philosophy, there is also an identity between the theory that concerns being, that is to say, ontology, and the theory that concerns the laws and the forms of thought, that is to say, logic. While, as in the identity of being and thought, thought is principal and being is secondary, Hegel then comes to consider that logic is the soul of ontology such that ontology has logic as the foundation. Hegel held thought as first and being as second, and he made logic the foundation of ontology. This is manifestly the fundamental principle of Hegel's idealist philosophy. However, here the rational kernel of Hegelian philosophy resides in the fact that, at the interior of an idealist philosophy, he correctly guessed the unity of the laws of thought and the laws of objectivity, the coincidence of ontology and logic. As Lenin said, Hegel actually proved that logical forms and laws are not an empty shell, but the reflection of the objective world. More correctly, he did not prove, but made a brilliant guess. More than this, the rational kernel of Hegelian philosophy also resides here in the fact that he underlined the active character, character decent, of thought. We know that human thought can not only reflect the objective world but equally, by pushing forth from known objective laws, can act and have an influence on the objective world, thereby transforming what was only found in thought, like an ideal, project, program, etc. into real being. The objective world is thus subordinated and belongs to it. The Hegelian point of view whereby things are the exteriorization of thought, where the exterior rise is negated and then returns to thought, develops the subjective activity of human consciousness in an idealist fashion. Hegel's idea of the coincidence between the logical and the historical is the concrete manifestation, in his philosophy, of the principle of identity between of thought and being. Hegel held that, since there is an identity between thought and being, the process of the development of thought and knowledge, and the development of being advances side by side. The first is what we call the logical, the second is what we call historical, the two coincides. Let us again take the examples in the logic and in the conception of history in Hegel's philosophy. When we explained Hegel's idea in the above that knowledge is the process which goes from the abstract toward the concrete, from the simple towards the complex, we said that the development of the concepts of Hegel's logic and the development of the history of philosophy follows this process that goes from the abstract towards the concrete, from the simple to the complex. Why do the two courses of development coincide? It is certainly not by chance. This is precisely the manifestation of the principle of the coincidence between logic and history. What we understand here by logic designates the process of the development of the history of philosophy. It is precisely from the basis of this principle that Hegel considers the historical order of appearance of philosophical systems and the order of the deduction of logical concepts as the same. From the basis of this principle, Hegel had roughly established parallel and corresponding relations between the order of logical concepts in logic and the order of the appearance of the philosophical systems in the history of philosophy. Thus, in logic, there is a category, being, it is the most original category, the most abstract and the most poor. Corresponding to this category, there is, in the history of philosophy, the philosophy of Parmenides, for whom the fundamental principle is the absoluteness of being. Hegel considered the place where logic begins as the commencement of the history of philosophy. That is why a true history of philosophy always begins, for Hegel, with the philosophy of Parmenides. In logic, there is the category of becoming, and there is, in the history of philosophy, a corresponding philosophy, the philosophy of Heraclitus, it considers becoming as the fundamental character of things. Along with this, in the history of philosophy, that which corresponds to the logical category of being in itself is the philosophy of Democritus. What corresponds to the logical category of substance is the philosophy of Spinoza. And what corresponds to the ultimate category, the supreme but also the most concrete, absolute idea, is the philosophy of Hegel himself. 
However, Hegel held that a total coincidence between logic and history is impossible, and that is why this sort of parallel relation and the correspondences described in the above are not absolute. For, in effect, real history always includes contingencies, it may have deviations, but, from a logical point of view, these are contingent phenomena, these are phenomena of deviation to be put aside. Also, what is logical, or under the purview of logic, is the placing contingency outside of real history. In speaking of the parallelism and the coincidence between the development of logical concepts and the development of the history of philosophy, Hegel underlines that these relations of parallelism and coincidence are not to be referred to but at a level of a whole, or approximately. We have only taken in the above the example of the history of metaphysics for explaining the coincidence of logic and history. In fact, for Hegel, it is not only the history of the development of metaphysics that coincides with the development of logical concepts, it is equally the case that the history of the development of everything real, the process of the development of everything real is also a process that goes from simple to complex, where the content unceasingly enriches itself. Hegel considered everything present as a result of something in the past, the ultimate result of historical development is like a great stream of water, the further it flows, the greater its volume, that is to say, the content becomes more and more enriched. In summarizing his thought on the coincidence between logic and history, Hegel thought, in rearranging everything, that history is nothing but the result of the development of logical concepts, this is clearly idealism. But the strict ties between the logical and the historical constitute the rational part of his philosophy. From the point of view of scientific materialism, the course of thought that goes from the simple to the complex, logic, corresponds to a real historical process. Marx's capital is the best example of a study of the principle of the coincidence of logic and history. Marx first studies commodity then money, and then capital. Here, commodity is the simplest category. Money is more complex than commodity. Capital is more complex than money. According to the process of knowledge, if we do not first understand the simple things, we cannot understand the complex things. This is why such a process of examination that goes from the examination of commodity to that of capital is not incidental or arbitrary, but determined by the logical order of thought, by the necessity of the process of knowledge. But, on the other hand, logic is the theoretical expression of real historical development, and the process of deduction of categories that goes from commodity to money and from money to capital is also determined by real historical development. These three things appear, in real historical development, according to an order that goes from simple to complex, from the inferior to the superior, from commodity to money, from money to capital, the appearance of money is later than commodity and capital later than money. After having explained all this, Marx indicated, to that extent the path of abstract thought, rising from the simple to the combined, would correspond to the real historical process. From this principle of the identity of thought and being, Hegel held, on the one hand, that logic and ontology coincide, and on the other hand, that logic and the theory of knowledge also coincide. The theory of knowledge is the theory concerning the process of knowledge, the content of that knowledge is existent things, being. Logic is a theory concerning the forms of thought but Hegel held that the forms of thought studied by dialectical logic are not arcane and abstract formulas, cut off from the content of knowledge but are rather strictly tied to the content, to a precise content and form. The order of the forms of thought, concepts and categories, that Hegel's logic studies is then not at all arbitrary, but coincides with the process of the development of knowledge and, with that, the course of the deepening the incessant concretization of the content of knowledge. If Hegel's logic parts ways with the concept of being, it is because the knowledge that we have of concrete things at the start is lacking and abstract. As such, when we have something like being but cannot say anything about it, the content of our knowledge is thus the lacking and abstract, the logical category corresponding to this stage of knowledge is being. The categories which follow being all correspond, for Hegel, to the content of knowledge, and, in the process of knowledge, we first have direct sensible knowledge and only after this do we penetrate the essence of things. While in logic, the category of being appears first and essence follows afterwards, in process of knowledge, knowledge of quantity demands a deeper understanding than quality. While in logic the category of quality appears first followed quantity, in the process of knowledge, the knowledge of dialectical relations between such and such a thing is more profound than the simple understanding of a thing, here also we first have the category of a thing and then that of causality, etc. In brief, the development of knowledge follows a course that goes from the abstract towards the concrete, from the simple towards the complex. The deduction of logical categories follows the same course. The two coincide. Even if the order of conversion of Hegel's logical categories is something forced or rigid, its logic as a whole lays out, in an idealist fashion, a rational dialectical thought of the coincidence between logic and the theory of knowledge. For better understanding the coincidence between logic and the theory of knowledge in Hegel, we will approach more particularly the problem of different types of judgment in the logic of Hegel. As we have said in the above, concrete truth is, for Hegel, the organic unity of many determinations. From this fundamental point of view, Hegel affirms that judgment is not in category exterior to or parallel with concrete truth but the development of it, the exposition and the explication of the particularities or determinations that comprises concrete truth. Let's take the judgment, gold is yellow. Yellow is an exposition of a particularity of this thing that is gold. From this perspective of judgment, Hegel, for the first time in the history of philosophy, had, in sticking close to content of knowledge, distinguished three great stages and four main types of judgment. 
the three great stages are that of being, essence and the concept, corresponding to the three major parts of the logic. The judgment at the stage of being is the essential judgment, the judgment at the stage of essence comprises reflective judgment and necessary judgment, and the judgment at the stage of the concept is called the conceptual judgment. These four types of judgment are not at the same level and do not have the same value, there is a hierarchy, a given order, each judgment that follows occupies a more elevated place than its precedent. Let us take for example, 1, roses are red, 2, roses are useful, 3, roses are plants, 4, this bouquet of roses is beautiful. According to the content of knowledge, the sense of the predicates, the four types of judgment become increasingly elevated, the first, the roses are red, is the most inferior such that the predicate of this type of judgment does not lay out anything but the particular direct and sensible qualities of the subject, roses, concrete things. For determining if the subject does or does not have this quality, it is sufficient to use our immediate sensations. For example, if we want to determine if the rose has this quality of redness, it is sufficient simply to use our sight. Hegel called these judgments essential judgments. This type of judgment shows that the content of knowledge has not yet attained the essence of the thing, it is not but direct and immediate, this type of judgment is but a stage of being, and we cannot say that it is equivalent to that of essence. The second type of judgment, such as the roses are useful, are called reflective judgment. The account of the predicate of this judgment does not only concern the particular direct and sensible qualities but the determinations relative to certain connections of the subject, in effect, saying that roses are useful bears the trait of the relation between roses and other things, this type of judgment accounts for the particularities of roses from their relation with other things. Hegel held that this judgment touched on the essence of things, such that, for him, the category of a thing is the reflection on itself in a relation. This judgment manifestly gives an account the content of the subject in a more concrete and profound way. This judgment is thus at a level above essential judgment. Higher than the reflective judgment is the necessary judgment, such as roses are plants. The account of predicates of this type of judgment are the relations between the substance and the subject. Like the reflective judgment, it belongs to the stage of essence, but it comprises more necessity, it more profoundly and more concretely accounts for the content and the particularities of the subject. This type of judgment is thus superior. However, the judgment that most profoundly and concretely accounts for the content and particularities of the subject is yet a fourth type of judgment, the conceptual judgment. This judgment shows whether a concrete thing, the subject, corresponds with its nature, with its concept, and to what degree it corresponds, thus the predicates beautiful, true, good, for example, this bouquet of roses is beautiful, this house is good. These judgments always compare a concrete thing to its concept, they compare this bouquet of roses to the concept of rose, they compare this house and the concept of house. Everything that corresponds to its concept, to its nature, is then beautiful, good and true. Also, when we say, this bouquet of roses are beautiful, it means that this bouquet of flowers has grown in conformity with its nature, to the concept of rose. When we say, this house is good, this means that this house has been constructed in conformity with the concept of the house. Hegel held that, by forming such a judgment, it is necessary to have the most profound and concrete knowledge of concrete things. Hegel's classification may certainly seem a little forced and obscure. When, in particular, he makes the apodictic judgment the unique and supreme judgment, this is where we find a manifestation of the idealist nature of his philosophy, however, as Engels said, the inner truth and necessity of this grouping will become clear, his classification places the different forms of judgment at higher and lower levels according to the process of the deepening of knowledge and thus profoundly describes the process of knowledge that one finds with concrete truth which goes from the abstract and indigent towards the concrete and profound, when the content of our knowledge is only the immediate existence of the object, or nothing but the particular abstract and sensible quality when our knowledge is only superficial and abstract, the form of thought that we use, the form of judgment, is the most inferior judgment, the essential judgment, when the content of our knowledge of being ranges over the determination of the relations of the object. When it penetrates the essence of the object, when our knowledge is more profound, the more concrete, the form of thought that we use is reflective judgment or even necessary judgment. What the conceptual judgment expresses is that we have the most profound and concrete knowledge of the object. For each sort of content of knowledge, there is a type of form of knowledge, the content of knowledge incessantly deepens itself and concretizes itself and the same goes for the form of knowledge, the whole of the conceptual system of Hegel's logic concretely demonstrates the principle of unity of the logic and knowledge. Of course, this principle is demonstrated by Hegel under an idealist form. We have outlined in the above some important dialectical ideas of Hegel's system, in fact, the rational thought of the Hegel's philosophical system is much richer than what we have developed here, even in the philosophy of nature, the weakest link in Hegelian philosophy, there are quite a few rational ideas. The ideas we cited when we spoke earlier of the natural stage are a clear proof of this. In Ludwig Feuerbach and the end of classical German philosophy, Engels said that it does not suffice to uselessly stop at the foot of the great edifice that is the idealist system of Hegelian philosophy, but rather, in penetrating it, we discover innumerable treasures. This praise by Engels is not at all excessive, even though what Hegel says is certainly not the dialectic of the objective world, in the dialectic of absolute spirit or absolute idea, in the process of reciprocal relation, mutual conversion, and the self-contradiction of purely logical concepts, in a word, in his idealist dialectic, 
he divined or, rather, he unconsciously reflected the dialectic of objective things themselves. For example, in Hegel's ideas with respect to movement and the incessant development of absolute spirit or the absolute idea, and the existence of internal relations in movement and development, we find that they unconsciously reflect the real situation of movement and incessant development of the real world where mutual and reciprocal relations condition all these phenomena. Equally, in Hegel's ideas on the self-movement of spirit, of the idea, where contradictions are the source of movement, and on the idea of the reciprocal conversion of the two concepts quality and quantity, these ideas also unconsciously reflected the real situation of internal contradictions and the transformations between quality and quantity in the real world. And even Hegel's ideas found in the process of the self-knowledge of spirit, of idea, a process that goes from the abstract to the concrete, from the simple to the complex, there again we find that they unconsciously reflect the process of deeper understanding and the incessant concretization of real human knowledge and so forth. In brief, in his idealist dialectic, in the dialectic of the concept, Hegel brilliantly divined the dialectics of things, phenomena, the world, nature, dot he had unconsciously reflected the dialectic of objective things themselves, therein resides the rational kernel of Hegel's dialectic and it great historical merit. Before the construction of Marxist philosophy, there were two methods that concerned the question of the development of the sciences, the first was the metaphysical method, the other was the Hegelian dialectic. However, the old method of metaphysics certainly could not have stimulated the development of the sciences, it was already destroyed in Kant's theoretical schema and above all by Hegel. Only the Hegelian method posed the problem of universality and the eternity of the dialectic development. It tried to make the world a process of movement, of transformation and incessant development, and to discover internal relations within them. It had an enormous historical feeling as a foundation. When it comes to the study of problems, it often takes the point of view of development and relation. Hegelian dialectics was thus, at the time, among the existing logical materials the only only material that is at least usable. These are precisely the rational elements that Marx and Engels had assimilated from Hegelian dialectic when they had created dialectical materialism. Hence, this is why the great Marxist-Leninist authors had highly appreciated the philosophy of Hegel. However, the dialectic of Hegel, with respect to its essence, is fundamentally idealist it is built from an anti-scientific basis. Hegel has only guessed the dialectic of objective things in his idealist dialectic and he did not have a scientific knowledge of the real objective process that appears dialectically. On the contrary, he had, under an idealist, mystical, form, fundamentally deformed this real objective process. This is why Hegelian dialectics in its existing form is unusable and, in assimilating the rational part of Hegel's dialectical method, Marx and Engels thus thought that it was necessary first to make a radical critique of Hegel's method, and by penetrating and rejecting his idealist residue, the dialectic might appear under its original aspect.